you learn swim? Now John was only a teacher, and he sent many of his messages through his music. His lessons were often the most simple ones of all, the living peace of one another. How many of the following Lenin song lyrics do you recognize? Love is a flower, you've got to let it grow. All you need is love. Imagine all the people share all the world. The love you take is equal to the love you make. War is over if you want it. All we are saying is give peace a chance. But there was another side to Lenin. The acidic and confrontational side. The side that was sick and tired of society's status quo, the, in the inequities and the power, the side that earned with many enemies from alienating, you know, alienating fans to the U.S. political establishment, the side that attacked fundamental norms like organized religion, national governments, and personal status. These were fights that he openly engaged, fights that he had no chance to ever prevail on his own. But there are many examples of this. A song you never heard on the radio anymore, for obvious reasons. One of his early 1970s pop songs was called Woman is the Nigger of the World. Remember that at all? Still a song as the anthology. It's a good song, actually, but the language of John is very anti-PC to this day, but there was a good point behind that. But probably the best example of his acidic side, other than his well publicized immigration now, were his statements on Christianity. You can remember them on the end, some of remember this one, too. He began with a very unfortunate interview during the height of Beatlemania in the U.S. when he said, quote, Christianity will go, it will vanish and shrink. I didn't argue with that. I'm right, and I'll be proved right. We're more popular than Jesus now. I don't know which will go first, rock and roll or Christianity. <laughs> this, of course, led to many outraged people and resulted in lots and lots of demonstrations of the Bible Belt, which included among other things, the burning of Beatles records. He was, later to, he was later forced to publicly apologize for his comments, but I don't think he ever totally redeemed himself, as he was quoted saying the following, my role in society, or as any artist or poet's role, was to try and express what we all feel, not to tell people how to feel, not as a preacher, not as a leader, but as a reflection of us all, and I believe in God, but not as one thing, not as an old man in the sky, I believe that what people call God is something in all of us. I believe that what Jesus and Muhammad and Buddha and all the rest said was right. It's just the translations of all the law and law. Jesus was all right, but his disciples were thick and ordinary. It's that twisting point that ruins it for me. Yeah. <laughs> Good apology. <coughs> then, of course, there's that fight for peace that began in the late 60s. A bit of an oxymoron because to him it really was a fight for peace. He said, I don't believe in killing, whatever the reason. You either get tired fighting for peace or you die. Our society is run by insane people for insane objectives. I think they're being run by maniacs for maniacal ends. I think I'm liable to put away as insane for expressing that. That's what's insane about it. His anti war protests and other related events earned him much publicity. But he questioned their effectiveness since he was often more focused on himself than actually the message. He thought many of his so called followers were only fans and not really into the message. So, risking total alienation shortly after he was broke up, he wrote a song called God, one of things, in which he rejected the fundamentals of society as he knew it. The opening lyrics were God is a concept by which we measure our pain. And he basically spouted off a whole series of things that he didn't believe in magic, chain, violent, tarot, Hitler, Jesus, etc., etc. And then he ended it, of course, with his most powerful statement I don't believe in Beatles. I just believe in me. And that's reality. The song goes on to say, The dream is over. I was the walrus, but now I'm John. And so, dear friends, it was not. No one I think is in that tree. I think it must be higher than the moon. That as it counts, you know, tune in, but it's all right. That as I think it's not too bad. Let me take you down, as I'm going to screw up every field. Nothing is real, and nothing to get up about. So what was the point? What was the point of John's words and actions? 
His cries for justice, peace, and equality offset his tender poetry and love. His causes were noble and well intentioned, but his methods sometimes married for the sublime and the ridiculous. In many ways, John lived his life in pain and dealt with his pain in different ways, from his abuse of drugs and alcohol to his personal mental relationships to his outward attacks on society. He shared his pain with us. Not surprisingly, all of his dealings with those pain in only ways only caused him more pain ultimately and kept him from the love that he so desperately sought. You know, and it wasn't until his reunion with Yoko and the subsequent birth of his second son, Sean, in 1975, that he was finally given to make peace with himself and those closest to him. Clearly, the last five years of his life were the happiest. But we never lost the urge to fight social inequities. He stopped being the circus ringleader who encouraged others to take up the fight in his place. He knew the fight was bigger than himself, and that to really change, to really get the change he wanted, was to require to change people's mindsets first from within. And we're going to that before, especially in this church. Said John, you have to give thanks to God, or where it is up there, for the fact we both survive. It took me 40 years to finally grow up. I see things now as I never knew they existed. 